Okay, well, thank you for coming for this session. On uh, what is capitalism? Good question. I think uh, if we just listen to Laura's very excellent introduction, and if we look around us today, we'd have to conclude that capitalism is chaos and crisis, instability and inequality, death and destruction. But whilst this list of dire features may be very accurate, it doesn't really tell us anything about what capitalism really is. It doesn't tell us what drives the economy. How does capitalism work? Or as is more often the case, capitalism not working. This kind of so-called explanation of capitalism is really a hallmark of the reformist left. It's very popular amongst these layers to list just nasty features of capitalism that they don't like. And often they put these under the umbrella of neoliberalism, implying that there's actually a nicer, kinder, greener form of capitalism somewhere out there, and saying that's what we should be striving for. And mostly when, it, when you boil it down, that means Keynesianism for these people, some sort of state-managed capitalism an attempt to patch up this rotten, sick system. And I think this reformist perspective, it only looks at the form of things, never at the content. It's simply a very moralistic description of capitalism, a rejection of certain characteristics of capitalism, and a utopian desire to somehow remove these features, these unpleasant features, whilst fundamentally keeping the system in place. And that's the thing, these reformists are fundamentally, they accept this system. Now, Marxism, by contrast, we describe as scientific socialism. Marx and Engels described it as scientific socialism. Marx, of course, acknowledged that capitalism was horrific and barbaric. He explained it's not some sort of eternal part of society. Capitalism isn't a product of an, an innate human nature, as some say. He explained that it's a mode of production that emerges through violence and force initially. As Alan quoted the other day, with blood and dirt dripping with, from every pore. But as Alan also highlighted, Marx's analysis of capitalism did not begin and end with these kind of moralistic concerns. In fact, in the Communist Manifesto, he highlights the progressive role that capitalism played in developing the productive forces in its youth. Marx and Engels say in the Communist Manifesto that capitalism has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids and Roman aqueducts. What he's referring to is the revolutionizing of the productive forces that you see under capitalism, the concentration of production, the creation of large-scale industry and machinery, the establishment of an integrated world market, and the forging, ultimately, of its own grave diggers, the working class. The basis of Marx's economic writings, in other words, was this scientific approach, based on the philosophy of dialectical materialism that we talked about this morning as well a philosophy that explains all phenomena, including the complex capitalist system, it explains these in their motion and development, in their interconnectivity, in their many-sidedness. In fact, Lenin said, if you really want to understand Marx's economic writings, if you want to read Capital, he said, you've got to read all of Hegel first. So maybe we should take a short break and go and brush up on our Hegel. For anyone who wasn't at this morning's session on dialectics. It's okay. I think we've got another session on dialectics tomorrow, so uh, we'll do the economics first, so hopefully it'll make more sense once you've had the dialectics tomorrow as well. But Marx wanted to understand capitalism not superficially and impressionistically. As I said before, it's some sort of list of uh, features or characteristics. He wanted to understand it as a system which was governed by its own objective laws and dynamics. In other words, by forces and tendencies that operate blindly behind our backs blindly and anarchically, and these forces that impose themselves upon society, upon individual economic agents, despite anyone's subjective wills or desires or intentions. In other words, capitalism is an economic system with its own intrinsic, cold, callous logic. And in fact, all the bad negative features that these reformists point to and want to do away with, all these features are actually an inherent part of that system. And that's why both Marx and us have drawn revolutionary conclusions. Now, Marx didn't start his economic analysis from nothing. He was armed with, as I say, with the powerful philosophy of dialectical materialism. And he applied this and, and built upon the ideas that came before him, the best economic ideas that came before him, which primarily meant the theories of what were called the classical bourgeois economic, economists. These products of the Enlightenment, people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo in Britain. These figures had also tried to develop economics as a science, uncovering the laws of capitalism as they saw it. And in fact, in doing so, they developed many of the ideas that Marx later took up as his starting point. 
And so they had the positive sides, which Marx built upon and enriched. But people like Smith and Ricardo also had the negative sides. The classical economists tended to see capitalism and the laws of capitalism as something eternal, as something ahistorical and natural. They didn't study the real development, the historical development of capitalism. But they based themselves instead on these kind of abstract thought experiments about people trading uh, just directly with one another, often on a desert island. Marx called these abstract models of, of two men exchanging goods on a desert island, he called it the Robinson Crusoe method. And in, the, in this thought experiments, what was good and uh, rational for the individual? Or what made sense for a pair of traders? You could just scale up and it would say it was good and rational for the whole of society. Because at the end of the day, these classical economists, they were liberals. And for them, society is nothing more than an amalgamation of individuals. And this was really the basis for Adam Smith's famous invisible hand of the market. A belief that if everyone just pursued their own individual interests, then the whole of society would be better off. And it was on these kind of individualistic and idealistic aspects of Smith's ideas that later bourgeois economists fixated. And Marx called these bourgeois economists the vulgar economists. Because instead of approaching the economy as a, a system that could be understood scientifically, which to their credit Smith and Ricardo had tried to do, Marx pointed out these bourgeois economists now, they were just apologists for capitalism. And you can clearly see that all the way through to today. Whether it's the free market libertarians, or Keynesian policymakers, or the so-called Marxist academics and intellectuals in universities, none of them have any genuine understanding of their own system, or any explanation for the crisis and instability that we see in the world today. Instead, we're fed all sorts of reactionary nonsense from these people. We're told that the wealth appropriated by the super-rich and hoarded by the super-rich will somehow trickle down to the rest of us. In recent years as well, with inflation uh, on, on the rampage, we've heard that in fact workers are to blame for inflation, apparently, for demanding too high wages. And competition and profit uh, are justified by asserting that this is the most efficient way of allocating society's resources in the interests of society as a whole. So if you were to ask a capitalist, what is capitalism? They would tell you it's an efficient market-based system that generates peace and prosperity for all. And of course, it provides liberty and freedom for the individual and society. This is absolute garbage and we have to answer it. But without, as the reformists do, falling back on those moralistic complaints that I talked about earlier. This kind of utopian and, uh, and ultimately very hollow rhetoric of the reformists. At the end of the day, we don't want to just give a negative analysis of what capitalism is. We want to understand it so that we can also provide a positive alternative, which is communism. So where do we begin? Well, Marx began his economic analysis by explaining and examining the building blocks of capitalism, the commodity. He says, under capitalism, society's wealth appears as an immense collection of commodities. And a, and a commodity, he explains, is a good or a service that's produced for exchange on the market, as opposed to things that you might individually produce for your own personal consumption. Now, commodities have actually existed throughout the whole of class society. You get produ commodity production exchange at a certain stage in the development of the productive forces. When you have the production of a surplus, when you have division of labor in society, when you start to have trade and exchange. But the economy in earlier forms of class society was, was not dominated by these kind of exchanges. In fact, most productive activity was personal for your own individual or family or, or village. And the majority of wealth was actually uh, directly appropriated. You had slavery where humans themselves were the tools in production, traded like cattle. Or you had feudalism based on the land, with the lord appropriating the, uh, the produce of his serfs. So capitalism, Marx explained, was that mode of production where now commodity production exchange is generalized and universalized. Thanks to wage labor, you now have workers stripped, you know, ripped from their land, put into the cities, forced to earn a wage and then buy everything they need on the market. That's what capitalism is, this generalized commodity production exchange where all of life's necessities are now bought and sold on the market. But Marx goes on and, and, and analyzes the commodity, the nature of the commodity. Stepping back, not analyzing this or that particular commodity, but commodities as a whole. Although if you read Capital, you find there's a lot of references to cloth and linen. 
Many pages of marks trying to work out how many yards of cloth are worth how many yards of linen. Most of us now are more used to just buying our clothes online, don't really think about the yards of linen and the cloth. But the analysis still holds. It says a commodity is, has a dual property. On the one hand, every commodity has to be useful. It has to have a use value, some sort of utility to society. Without this quality, there'd be no demand for these commodities and you wouldn't be able to exchange them. And if something can't be exchanged and sold, then it's not really acting as a commodity at all. But that's only half the picture. Because the real question is, well, how much of one commodity can you exchange for another? In other words, there's got to be some sort of quantitative relationship that connects each commodity to another. Every commodity, Marx says, must therefore have an exchange value, explaining its relation or proportion to other commodities. Now, well, how is that value determined? And this idea was already grasped in a partial way by Marx's predecessors. In fact, you can go right back to Aristotle and the ancients, and they had some understanding that, that, that where value was coming from. But it's only under capitalism where commodity production exchange becomes generalized that you could really start to understand what value was. Where value is this law imposing itself upon society actually starts to become a real force. And these predecessors of Marx and Marx himself, they started by asking, what's the one thing that all commodities actually have in common? What property do they all share? They all have very different physical qualities and utilities. Marx was talking about linen and cloth, but you could talk about any commodity you like, anything you can buy in the shops and the supermarkets. It doesn't make sense to try and compare them uh, along some sort of subjective measure. This is what the right-wingers do with the theory known as marginal utility theory. In other words, something is valuable because it's useful to someone in a particular moment. But this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't help you compare things in general, on average, across the whole of society. And in fact, all of the, the so-called theoreticians of marginal utility theory, they base themselves on very abstract thought experiments like the Robinson Crusoe method. You know, a fisherman out at sea or a, a, a woodchopper in the forest or a, 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 like I say, a Robinson Crusoe on a desert island. Whereas you can see today, you know, that's not how the majority of people live in society. So we've got to find something that all commodities share, something that allows them to be compared with one another. And this common quality, Marx and others pointed out, is the fact that they are all products of labor. Labor, along with nature, is the source of all wealth in society. And labor, applied in the course of production, is the source of all new value in society. And this fact is the foundation of what's known as the labor theory of value, which was actually developed by Smith and Ricardo. And the labor theory of value explains that the value of a commodity depends on the relative amount of labor time contained within it. But the problem for, with Smith and Ricardo's concept of the labor theory of value is that this was seen from the perspective of just the isolated individual, a Robinson Crusoe on his island, for example, comparing his products according to the amount of time he's invested personally in them. So he might spend four hours in the morning crafting a nice wooden boat. And then in the afternoon, feeling a bit peckish, he would uh, go and spend another four hours harvesting 100 coconuts. And he'd write down his calculations and realize, well, in that case, 100 coconuts must be the same worth as one boat. Well, Marx took this idea and developed it with the understanding and the explanation of socially necessary labor time. And by explaining the difference between value and price, we don't exchange our products as individuals, Marx pointed out. But through the market, the world isn't made up of people trading directly through barter. But as I say, buying and selling on the market, in shops and online. And when you do this, you're confronted with a market price, an objective price that faces you. And this price reflects the socially necessary labor time, Marx said, which means the average time taken to produce a given commodity based on certain social and historical conditions. In other words, based on the current level of technology and technique. The market doesn't care if you're slow or super productive. You know, if you're trying to sell something on eBay, no one says, well, how, hang on, how long did you actually take to produce this? But you see a ton of other people selling very similar things and you have to sell it at roughly the same amount. If a business is too inefficient, in other words, its costs will be above the market price and it will go under. You'll be outcompeted. You won't be able to sell your goods online. On the other hand, if you're a super efficient business, then you can sell well above your costs and you make a super profit. Or in fact, you can drive your price right down and try and kick all your competitors out of the market. So this is what Marx meant by value, this idea of an objective price in reflecting socially necessary labor time. Now, in order to really get to the heart of the matter 
and draw out the most essential uh, questions around the, this idea of the law of value. Marx, when he's talking about his labor theory of value, assumes a free market. But when this isn't the case, when you might have some sort of restriction on supply, for example, like some sort of monopoly that, that gets to dictate the price without worrying about supply and demand, then prices can vastly exceed their actual value. In fact, most of us here living in any big city will have experienced this with housing costs. When because of, because of the profit motive, there's a, a restricted supply and a lot of demand. The, the, the rent you pay, which is effectively the, uh, the, 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 the price of uh, accommodation, vastly exceed the actual costs. And the same is true of rare items, things that are in limited supply. Like a fine work of art, for example. You, know, you can find Picasso paintings at auction houses that sell for billions and billions. Maybe millions, I don't know. I've never bought a Picasso painting. But I have bought a print of a Picasso painting. And that actually affirms the labor theory of value. Because that didn't cost millions. It cost a few pounds. Because the technology to print something and make it generalized, because it's so homogenous, there's so many potential prints out there, the price actually tends towards the real socially necessary labor time. So the next time some clever clogs tries to tell you that everything's about pr that someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, well, then just point out this example to them. Try and sell them a, a print of a Picasso for millions of pounds. The point is, in an ideal free market, the, what, as the assumption that Marx makes, in that ideal free market, value is the axis around which prices fluctuate. Prices that fluctuate because of supply and demand. Under capitalism, price signals act to, to help you know, uh, guide investment around the economy. And in turn, they act back upon supply and demand. If demand vastly exceeds supply, then the price will go way above the value. And the capitalists will flood into that market, investing to try and get some of the super profits that are available there. In doing so, they'll bring supply back towards demand. On the other side, if supply vastly exceeds the demand, then you'll have industries closing because prices will plunge and put the least efficient businesses out of business. So price is then the variable and the volatile. They're in this constant state of flux. Behind this seeming randomness and uh, chaos lies something objective. In fact, amidst this chaos, there's, there's a certain order. Commodities prices might seem accidental, but there's this objective law lawfulness that governs the, ex the, the, the exchange of commodities. Take another example. Let's think about cars and pens. I have a pen, I can't afford a car. And in fact, I guarantee that even if I had the nicest pen that you could pretty much find, you would struggle to find anyone who's willing to exchange it for even the most beaten up car. Because on average, the relative prices of these things will actually reflect something else. Not their supply and demand, because there's a lot of pens and there's a lot of demand for pens, there's a lot of cars, there's a lot of demand for cars. And, and not their usefulness, because if you need a pen, what use is a car? And you probably won't get very far sitting on a pen. Instead, what their prices reflect is this socially necessary labor time that's embodied within them. And Marx points out that includes both dead labor, he calls it, the raw materials, the machinery, the tools, the factories, the infrastructure that goes into these uh, commodities. Calls it dead labor because it's, it's, already, it's already embodied in those commodities that go into other commodities. And then on top of that, you have the living labor, the labor, they, the labor applied in the process of production of this new commodity. And that together uh, across society is giving you the average socially necessary labor time. And this is the labor theory of value. It's, it's the law of value, if you like, a law that governs the capitalist market economy, but in this completely unplanned anarchic way. It's a law that imposes itself on the economy to establish the proportion in which different commodities are exchanged and therefore their prices on the market. It regulates the allocation of society's resources according to the invisible hand. And accordingly, it shapes the whole global division of labor, of course, according to profit, not need. And it also determines the value of money, which is a key question today for understanding the scourge of inflation. And if we're going to understand inflation, we've got to first ask, what is money? Money, Marx points out, is above all a measure of value. It's a kind of common yardstick against which all other commodities can be compared. It emerges historically, Marx says, as a universal equivalent. Some sort of real commodity like gold or silver that can be exchanged for all others and facilitate trade. 
Because what money does then is break up exchange into two acts. You have now a sale and a purchase. You have what you call CM, commodities exchange for money, and then MC, that money exchanged back for other commodities. And therefore money is kind of like a, a claim to social wealth. If you hold money, you expect to be able to exchange it for commodities, for some sort of part of the wealth in society. But the problem is that over time, uh, instead of gold or silver, money becomes a mere token. It becomes a mere representation of value, Marx says. Because, you know, you don't want to be lugging gold and silver coins around with you if you're traveling and trading as some sort of, sort of merchant. You start getting banking and development of paper notes. Promissory notes, Marx uh, points out. Nowadays, it's digital transactions, numbers on a screen. But the thing is, these numbers and tokens, they have to be linked to something real. They have to be tied to the actual wealth in society, anch anchored to actual commodities that are being produced. And this helps us explain this menace of inflation that's really terrorized the working class in recent years. Because uh, the law of value uh, determines ultimately this. If you've got a certain amount of commodities being circulated in the economy, but the money representing the value of those commodities, the money supply doubles, then prices are going to double. And this is exactly what happened, really, with the ruling class's response to the pandemic. You had a deluge of money that was printed and then pumped into the world economy in order to bail out capitalism. On the other hand, you had supply shocks and bottlenecks that throttled the production of commodities. So the amount of money... The amount of money circling was going up and up, but the amount of wealth inside the commodities being produced was, was staying the same or getting less. So we can see very clearly that it was not workers and it is not workers who are responsible for inflation. It's the anarchy of the market combined with the recklessness of the ruling class. Now, for many people, money is almost synonymous with capitalism, but money has existed for many centuries before capitalism came into being. As, as the title of Marx's probably most famous book, or one of the most famous books, suggests, uh, capitalism isn't just about money, it's about capital. And capital, Marx explained, is value seeking to create more value. He calls it self-valorizing value, money that's invested to make more money. In the past, you had this CMC that I described, commodity, exchange for money, back into commodity. But capitalism begins and ends with money. In fact, it ends with more money. That's the whole point, to make a profit. It's MCM dash, Marx says, the dash representing money plus more money. And what the capitalists care about is investing their money in means of production and labor to make more money, to make a profit. And capitalism is really only possible with the development of a financial system, a credit system, which we still see dominating society today. We'll talk about this in the session on imperialism tomorrow. And the role of that financial system is to take in all these little sums of money that individuals might have, your personal savings, any pensions. People are saying, what's that? I don't, I, I've not heard of this. A pension? That's, that's something they had a long time ago. But it takes all of that little bits of money and it turns it into capital. It turns quantity into quality. A, a size, a sum of money that the capitalist can invest now to make more money. Because as capitalism develops, the money you need to invest in, to, to enter into the market becomes bigger and bigger. You know, I can't just turn up and decide to get in on the uh, silicon trip, uh, gravy train by uh, investing in a big factory making microchips. It takes billions and billions to invest in a new microchip factory these days. Hence why all of these industries are dominated by giant monopolies that keep all the new entrants out. And the financial system, it, it becomes fully developed under capitalism with stock markets, investment banks. And we, we might think of uh, the capitalist as like that guy in uh, Monopoly, Mr. Moneybags. In fact, I think we've had him on the front page of our paper in Britain a few times. Apparently, you're not allowed to put Elon Musk's face on the front of a paper with a, a chopping board, you know. But the point is that kind of Mr. Moneybags idea of an industrialist, uh, an entrepreneur, doesn't really exist anymore. In fact, a lot of the people actually uh, managing businesses, they're now just bosses who are paid a wage in a lot of cases. And in fact, the real capitalists are the ones who own the stocks and the shares, who have these investments. Or in fact, the people running the hedge funds who in turn manage the wealth of other people. Marx described them as rentiers or coupon clippers. 
these parasites who play no productive role in, in production. Instead, they own these bits of paper which they think entitle them to a certain slice of the profits made in society. They expect some sort of rate of profit according to the capital that they own. And it's this, these developments that gives rise to this enormous speculation that we see today. Where it's no longer about trading values but pieces of paper. These entitlements to future profits that haven't even been made yet, that don't even really exist. And this is what Marx referred to as fictitious capital. And this, as I say, it shows the completely parasitic nature of capitalism today. And the capitalists and their apologists, they think that they can profit simply from swindling, from cheating. And the vulgar economists who I talked about earlier, they promoted this idea. They said that profit was simply uh, obtained through exchange, by buying cheap and selling dear. But Marx noted you can't make any real profit. You can't, uh, society doesn't get richer as a whole through swindling and exchange. All, all the exchange does is to redistribute wealth that's already been created somewhere else. It just transfers or redistributes from wealth from one person to another. In fact, he points out if everyone just goes around charging a little bit extra compared to what they were charged, then, you, then that's just going to cause inflation. It doesn't make society richer as a whole. So how does that happen? Well, this, the, the, this, what Marx called the enigma of profit, is what eluded the classical economists. And, and solving this enigma was the big leap forward that Marx made in his economic writings. By explaining the solution lies not in exchange, but in production. And the, the key for understanding this mystery lies in a very special commodity. And that's the commodity that the working class sells, which is its labor power. That is a worker's capacity to work for a given duration, like for a month, a week, a day, or even just an hour. And, and this capacity to work is what the capitalist buys, is what they purchase. It's not labor itself, but the ability of the worker to work. And this difference between labor and labor power is very important. It's like the difference between paying for some light and paying for a light bulb. You know, you buy the light bulb to produce the light. You don't pay for software or data, rather, uh, you pay for a computer that produces that data. And that's the same with the capitalists. They buy the labor power that does the labor. The labor, in other words, is like the use value of the worker's labor power. And the wages are the exchange value of that labor power, the price of it. And in fact, the source of profits is the difference between the two. Because the value that the worker produces in the course of an hour a day is less than what's paid back to them in the form of wages. And this is only possible because labor power is itself a commodity. And like every other commodity, it has a value determined by its socially necessary labor time. In the case of labor power, that is the labor time needed to produce and reproduce the working class as a whole. That's what determines the average wage, the average price of labor power. The labor time needed to go into the clothing, the housing, the education, the healthcare, and, the, and, and raising a family for the working class. And this is where the solution to the mystery of profit lies. That the fact that the socially necessary labor time needed to maintain the working class is less than the value uh, that they produce. A worker might work for eight hours a day, but it might take only, say, four hours for them to produce a value equivalent to all the commodities that they consume. In other words, the working class only receives back a fraction in the form of wages uh, the value that they produce. And the unpaid labor of the working class is the source of surplus value. And surplus value is then divided up amongst the different sectors of the capitalists. 
You have the, the rents for the landlord, you have the interest for the bankers, and then you have the profit for the industrialists, for the capitalists, for the bosses. Now you have the average wage of the working class that it receives, you have to point out it's historically and socially determined. It's not some absolute. Obviously there are physical needs that set a bottom, a floor, uh, a minimum. Although we should point out that even there, the, the capitalists and the landlords today, through a tax on wages, through rising rents, they've actually made life unlivable for a lot of workers. And on a side note, you even have splits within the capitalists over this question. A lot of the serious capitalists are very angry at the landlords for the, for the amount of rents are going up. Because workers can't afford to live in the cities where the capitalists need workers. So you ever, if you ever see capitalist politicians complaining about rents, it's not because they care about the rent that you and I pay. It's because they care about the industrialist who's telling them, hey, look, we need some uh, lower rents so the workers can afford to live near where, we, where we're producing. But the needs of the worker are also social. You know, as capitalism develops, as society changes, new needs arise. It'd be very hard to be a productive worker, productive to a capitalist, to a boss, if you didn't have a smartphone these days, for example. If you're one of these delivery drivers paid a very low wage, you need a smartphone just as part of your job to get around. But of course, you're expected to pay for that, so it's got to come out of your wage. And no matter what company you work for, your boss expects to be able to communicate with you 24-7 on your smartphone. So these become part of the, the needs, the social needs of, of a worker, of a productive worker, productive from the point of view of capitalism. And of course, the maximum wage level is going to be determined by what's profitable for the capitalists. And uh, that's why they fiercely resist every wage rise by the working class and why they try and blame workers for inflation because they know that every real wage rise for the working class is, a, is, a, 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 is going to come out of the profits of the capitalists. So you have these minimum and maximum, if you like, for the wages. But we've got to emphasize that everything in between is determined by the class struggle. And this is important that we have to get across. The economy isn't uh, some set of graphs or curves or equations in some sort of economics textbook or on a computer model. Capitalism isn't a, a mechanical machine in which we're all inanimate cogs. The economy is made up of real living flesh and blood. It's made up of human beings struggling to put food on the table. And importantly, it's, a, it's, it's an economy divided into classes with mutually antagonistic interests. Fundamentally, the capitalists on one side, driven by profit to increase their profits, uh, driven by competition to increase their profits. And then the workers on the other side, compelled to sell their labor power in exchange for a wage in order to obtain basic necessities and compelled also to organize and mobilize to improve their living standards and to defend previous gains that they fought for. In fact, Marx says, without this kind of organization, the working class is simply raw material for exploitation. Now, going back to the secret of profit, understanding this is, is the key to understanding all the dynamics of capitalism. Because that's what capitalism is, fundamentally. It's a profit-driven system. And it, and it explains this, this, this idea of profit, the dynamics of capitalism, it explains the progressive role that capitalism could play in the past. Because as I said, the capitalist uh, buys up the labor power of the worker, unlike previous modes of production. And competition then forces them to get as much out of this worker as they can within the time that they've bought. In other words, it gives an incentive to the capitalist to invest in that worker, to make them more productive, more skilled. And also to intensify labor, to get more and more out of the worker to try and reduce their labor costs as well so they can produce below the current value, below that socially necessary labor time. It creates this drive, this incentive for the capitalist to invest in technology and technique, in machinery and automation, to try and improve the productivity of labor. In other words, to, to increase the amount of use value that is produced in a given unit of labor time. And this is why you see a, a rapid development of the productive forces in capitalism's golden age. But it also explains uh, the, the, the kind of uh, the questions, the, the, the fears that people have over automation today.
and understanding that technology is not introduced for our benefit, but for the capitalist profits. And a fear that, in fact, we are going to be put out of our jobs by the robots, by the, the, the chatbots. But that's the thing, is all of these uh, initially uh, progressive forces of competition and profit, they pile up these contradictions. And they turn into their opposite. Capitalism sows the seeds for its own future crises. Private ownership and production for profit, along with the nation state, become this enormous barrier to social progress. And Marx identifies many of these contradictory processes and phenomena under capitalism. He identifies, for example, what he calls the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. The fact that investment in machinery and technology actually leads to a, a falling rate of profit over time for the capitalists. Because at the end of the day, it's only that living labor, the, the, the labor applied in production by humans, that actually creates new value, that creates profit. Marx points out that the, uh, the value in any commodity can be divided up. As I said earlier, you have that dead labor, or what he refers to as constant capital. The, the raw materials, the equipment, the, the factories, the infrastructure. On the other side, you have the living labor I talked about earlier as well, which is split up into the variable capital, that is the money that the capitalist pays for labor power, for wages, plus the surplus value, the, the workers' unpaid labor. Marx points out that constant capital, he calls it constant because it doesn't add any new value, doesn't create any surplus. Machines, factories, software, all of these things simply transfer their existing value over to commodities in the course of production. And it's only the variable capital, the labor power that the capitalist purchases that produces this new surplus value. So things like artificial intelligence and automation, robots, all of that can seem quite impressive. If you ask me, most of the time it doesn't look that impressive. I'm still waiting for AI to design us the best possible front page. And put me out of a job. No, I don't do any designing. I'm an editor. Anyway. Um, but the point is that all of these things, they're just tools at the end of the day for increasing workers' productivity. And what you see is that more investment over time in this technology means more, uh, more of that C, that constant capital, relative to the V, the variable capital. It means more machinery behind every individual worker. And in English, we have this expression, that the, the, the goose, uh, killing the goose that lays the golden egg. In other words, workers are the ones producing the, the golden egg, the, the profit. And you're replacing them with machines or chatbots that can only transfer their existing value. And the result is that all other things being equal, the capitalists see this falling rate of profit as they invest in technology and machinery. And it's these, it's these same dynamics, these dynamics of profit and uh, capitalist accumulation that also cause free competition to turn into its opposite and which create this chasm of inequality that we see under capitalism, which Laura described earlier. You see how the more efficient businesses drive the weaker ones out of business and gobble them up, leading to these giant monopolies that dominate over us and over the economy, leading to this enormous concentration of wealth in the hands of a tiny handful, and creating, as Marx said, accumulation of wealth at one pole and accumulation of misery, toil and degradation at the other. And it's this nature of capitalism itself that leads to crises. Marx and Engels say that capitalism becomes like the sorcerer who can no longer control the powers that he's conjured up. In other words, capitalism creates these forces of production that more and more outstrip the limits of the capitalist market itself. In other words, workers, because of the profit motive, because of the, the origins of profit, because profit is only the unpaid labor of the working class, it means that workers can never afford to buy back all the commodities that they, that capitalism is producing. And this is what leads to these crises of overproduction, as Marx calls them. And this is the point. These crises are inherent to the system. They're not an accident. They're rooted in the fact that this is a profit system and that profit comes from the unpaid labor of the working class. And it's the same with inequality. The reformists think they can get rid of it by just redistributing wealth. But the capitalist profits are founded on inequality. 
They're founded on the fact that there is a, a tiny minority that owns the means of production and a vast majority that has nothing to sell but their labor power. Now, today, uh, we're over 15 years on since possibly the biggest crisis in the history of capitalism, the 2008 slump. This was an organic crisis of capitalism, we call it. In other words, not just uh, part of the kind of uh, uh, regular cycle, the, the boom and slump, if you like. But, but a crisis that represents this real turning point uh, in society, a turning point uh, reflecting all the accumulated contradictions coming to the surface. It's a crisis uh, from which there has never really been any real recovery. Um, but in fact, it's a crisis that has been compounded further by the pandemic, by war, and by the capitalist attempts to get out of the previous crisis. Of course, with the working class expected to pick up the bill at every stage. And in fact, with no end in sight, only more intensifying contradictions. The ruling class has repeatedly had to bail out its own system with endless state interventions, support, stimulus, really destroys this uh, myth of the so-called free market. But now the thing is the ruling class, the capitalists, they have no more ammunition left in their arsenal. In fact, as was described yesterday, they're sitting on this ticking time bomb of debt and everything they're doing is preparing the ground for the next big slump which many are saying is imminent, coming on top of all the instability we already have. And the, the ruling class, their system, it's pushing them in this direction. Their actions are pushing towards this next slump with increasing protectionism, conflict and speculation. It, it's clear that the capitalists have no solutions. Keynesianism and government spending hasn't worked. Austerity and attacks on the working class haven't worked. But the point is there's no such thing as a final crisis of capitalism. The ruling class will continue to try and make workers pay and, and, and youth and the poor pay for capitalism's crisis through further attacks and austerity. Of course, all that's going to do is add to that accumulated anger that's already built up, an anger against the whole establishment. And already it's provoking revolutionary explosions in one country after another. And our task as revolutionary communists is to march at the head of these struggles and point out that capitalism cannot be patched up. It has to be overthrown. Thank you. We're going to start with a few questions. A lot of people had questions, actually. So we might need to uh, give Adam uh, some extra time to uh, sum up at the end so we can cover all the answers. But if, um, you know, if, if the questions make you think of something you want to say, you can raise your hand and I'll try to squeeze you in. Don't be shy. So uh, Adam from uh, Great Britain is going to ask the first question. Go ahead. Hi, comrades. Uh, my question is, um, we said that the crisis of overproduction is caused by workers not being paid the full value of their labor. So my question is, why can't the capitalist class uh, buy up the goods in society that the workers cannot afford? Yeah, and, and in doing so, avoid the crisis of over, overproduction. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Ismail from Switzerland is next. Um, hi. So, yes, my question is, why is there um, waste even when there's no crisis of overproduction under capitalism, like food waste? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, comrade. Next is uh, Frank from Austria. Uh, hello, comrades. Uh, we've talked about uh, dead labor not producing any surplus, uh, only the life labor doing so. But why and especially how does it do that uh, in relation to AI? Because the current trend uh, is to switch out uh, loads of human workers with AI, uh, which if the AI, uh, if the AI is cheaper than the human, obviously, um, make the capitalist more profit. But why would we as Marxists say that this is not correct? Thank you. Thanks, comrade. Uh, next is Erica from the US, followed by Saul from Britain. All right, um, when I joined, I was given very good advice to not just read Capital straight away. So after, um, after somebody, maybe me, has read all the basics, to understand the law of value, exploitation, imperialism, and overproduction. 
I was wondering, you know, what is inside Capital, those three volumes? Yeah. I, I just, I just want to know, like, you know, what's, what's the extra sauce? <laughs> Thanks, comrade. Saul will ask another question, and then the final question will be from Peter from Great Britain. Hi, comrades. Um, my question is that as communists, it's clear that the international crisis of capitalism is fundamentally a crisis of overproduction, right? Um, but time and time again, you see the ruling class, figures like Elon Musk, um, point the finger at a crisis of overpopulation and overconsumption instead. It's a, a clear, like, blaming of the working class and um, external forces rather than the capitalist system itself, as you can expect from them. But I, I think it would be good if we could um, discuss um, like the futility of this overpopulation argument and ultimately why overproduction is the real cause of the international crisis of capitalism. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Uh, Peter will be the final question. Uh, if you have other questions, of course, feel free to uh, raise your hand. That's a lot of questions for Adam to answer. I think at least one other person in the audience might have this or that answer. So if you do want to get on stack uh, to, uh, to speak on any of these, please raise your hand. And then uh, next after Peter uh, will be Matteo from Italy. Hi, comrades. So Adam already has a lot of questions. Um, so I'm just going to add two easy ones that I think uh, could be useful to hear some more discussion on. So considering the overwhelming crisis of debt that the entire globe is facing at the moment, I think some people might ask, well, is it feasible for the ruling class at some point to just decide to cancel all debt? My instinct says no, but maybe Adam could uh, answer, or anyone from the audience answer, why not? And the second question is on nation state. So the capitalists actually tried to overcome the economic limitations of the nation state on their own, uh, on their own basis, uh, forming things like European Union, for example. And as we can see, it seems to be, uh, the whole project seems to be failing. Um, and maybe we could discuss why. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Matteo from Italy will be followed by, uh, sorry, comrade, I don't know your name. Alex. Hello, everyone, comrades. It's really an honor to be here for me. So I want to talk about uh, uh, how the economy impacts the scientific research. So, so first of all, we know that capitalism drives also its economy into the cultural world and into the scientific uh, uh, scenario, into the scientific uh, uh, people. And, and capitalism tries to put a common mindset into the masses to which is aligned to the establishment. So the capital has its own interest into taking people from lower classes and to cannibalize their will into supporting capitalism. And this is reflected inside of the scientific and academic community. So the profit economy transforms every research institute into a factory with its publish or perish mentality. And this gives basically the production of more of the same work without any innovation. As Alan and Ted says also in their beautiful book, Reason in Revolt, the capitalists favor an idealistic and subjective view in order to justify their economic system, posing an impenetrable barrier between uh, the workers and the minds of the classes, of the low classes, of the worker classes, and, uh, the, uh, and the knowledge, and the uh, higher knowledge. And this brings to the alienation of the workers. In fact, in the scientific community, people are overworked and they are selling their labor power for less than what is valued. 
they sell it for really cheap and uh, with contracts that last for one and or two years, and they are forced to go around the world without a fixed place. And this, is, this goes back to the theory of Marx of alienation, where all these workers cannot say, they cannot have some place to be called home. And so they are, in fact, alienated from their own work. So these workers have developed a view of the scientific community that is as of survival and not of endeavoring the new knowledge. This transformation of the academia into a factory has brought a lot of researchers into not believing actually into the scientific method, but in order to survive, they try to abide by the rules of the capitalist system and to follow what the other companies try to push. I can make an example of, uh, uh, about physics. In physics, there is a really big push towards quantum computing, but this has both an overproduction of papers and works in this field without any actual breakthrough. And this is true for all other fields. So companies decide what the line of research is, and it's not anymore the research, the researchers that decide what needs to be researched. So I'll try to be quick, since Adam has a lot of questions to be answered. <laughs> My point is that uh, under capitalism, under this economic system, even the scientific endeavor, even the method of investigation of nature is subjected to the rules and to the chains of uh, the owners. So cultural and scientific uh, research are not free from this, uh, uh, from this game that capitalists are playing. And science cannot advance without uh, making a breakthrough, a revolution in its own method of research. But under these circumstances, a lot of things are piling up. So we will arrive at the point where quantity becomes quality, and even in scientific and cultural research and, uh, and fields, we will have a new revolution that can help the socialist revolution and can be at its side in order to bring our world in what we want to have. So a lot has been said, has been said in these two days about how in the uh, Russian Revolution, for example, we achieved as human beings some new degrees of education and research. So this proves that only under the socialist system we can have free science and free education and free heart. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, comrade. Next is Alex, followed by Erica. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to take a crack at kind of two questions because I think they overlap a little bit. So. Under capitalism, uh, the exchange and production of commodities is how life is produced. Um, but we uh, encounter commodities in finished form. Uh, we don't see the labor that has gone into it. And so we don't understand why a thing costs what it does. Marxist economics tells us that price is guided by the law of value. And you can't understand value in terms of the things themselves, but rather uh, you must look at the uh, time and uh, 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 labor that goes into uh, its production. Uh, but because this is uh, hidden, um, relations between things um, uh, cover relations between people. Um, this is something Marx referred to as commodity fetishism. It mystifies uh, the true relations. Um, so, let's take the question of AI. Tomemos la pregunta de la inteligencia artificial. AI has the capacity to uh, shorten labor time. La inteligencia artificial tiene la capacidad de bajar el tiempo de que algo se produce, de el, el tiempo de labor. An artist can create uh, a, a graphic design more quickly with an AI rendering. Un artista puede crear un diseño gráfico más rápidamente con la asistencia de la inteligencia artificial. But they must 
imbue some labor into it to create that finished product. Pero tienen que eh, hacer algo de labor, de trabajo, para crear ese eh, producto final. Just as labor was necessary to create the AI models. Justo como eh, fue necesario a, a, a hacer labor, hacer trabajo para crear los algoritmos de inteligencia artificial, a, artificial en sí. It can't create new value and that's not what the capitalists actually believe. Um, I'll leave it to Adam to describe the specific differences between living and dead labor. Sorry. But, um, pardon, lost my thought. Um, sorry. Yes, what capitalists intend to do with AI is to remove the uh, creativity and individuality um, in the process. They can't remove humans and human laborers from the, pro from, from the, from the process. To label the data that they're trained on, human laborers must uh, put labels on data. They enlist people in uh, oppressed countries in Africa to sift through masses of data that in involve uh, gore, um, terrible images, to filter them out of the, um, out of the model. Um, Amazon has uh, these self-checkout uh, self machines that are supposed to tell when you have a product in hand. But in reality, Indian workers were watching through cameras and noting down when someone had taken a product out. So they are not eliminating human labor. They are only degrading human labor and making it cheaper. Because this is the process that capitalism uh, proceeds on. Uh, this is what um, Marx refers to as the accumulation of capital. Capitalists are not uh, satisfied to just um, uh, feed themselves on their profits. They must turn those profits into new capital. They must uh, increase the scale of production. Uh, increase the productivity of their machines. And the effect this has is to uh, make the, the workers an appendage to the machine. And to reduce, to reduce the uh, number of workers they need to employ, while being uh, creating more commodities that are then cheaper. So it's they have to they can pay them less and buy fewer workers. Uh, um, now the effect this has is that uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the capital they have is increasingly dedicated to, to machines to means of production. And a section of the working class is increasingly pushed to the side. They are cast out of the factories, tem uh, temporarily or permanently. They constitute what uh, Marx refers to as the Industrial Reserve Army. This surplus population uh, puts a downward pressure on uh, the, the actively working uh, people's wages um, and limits how much better the... Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> there, 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 there. Um, a, a number of like increasing numbers of people are condemned to this state of idleness, while those in the factories are condemned to overwork. Today, some of these uh, extra workers are uh, utilized through things like gig work. They are lying around for the capitalists to use for whatever purpose, because they are only useful so long as they can produce uh, surplus. And so this is where uh, overpopulation and Malthusianism looks at it backwards. It's not that there are too many people, that the working class has grown too much. It is that capital has grown too much. It, uh, it, it increasingly cannot absorb the, uh, n the working class. And it reproduces this division uh, between the active and the uh, idle army. In fact, it depends on its existence. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks, comrade. After Erica from the U.S., uh, will be Nelson from Britain. 
I want to take a crack at the answer or the question about overproduction, even though I haven't read Capital. Um, why can't the capitalists buy up the surplus that workers can't afford? To, to solve the crisis of overproduction. Well, everybody knows communists are the most empathetic people. We can put ourselves in the capitalist shoes. So I ha if I have all this capital that I got from exploiting you, what do I need to do with it? Well, first I need to reinvest it back into production. If I immediately go spend it on all the bread and toys and cars and diamonds you can't buy, then I can't replace the equipment or upgrade machines or pay the rent on my factory and office space. And I can't improve the technique. There'd be no development of production at all. That's more of an industrialist problem. But if I step into the shoes of a capitalist in the age of imperialism, there would also be no money to fight wars which imperialists like me have to fund in order to keep my position as a capitalist. I don't want to get beat out by all the others. Um, this is a life or death question for me. I might have to become a worker just like you. It's why Biden says, if there wasn't an Israel in the Middle East, we'd have to make one and why every single American and British imperialist line up behind it. If the capitalists spend all their money on all the things Amazon can't sell, which is buying everything that they already paid the workers to produce, they just shove it in a warehouse, where would the money be to bomb hospitals in order to make sure the investments return profits? Put yourself in their shoes. I think there's another part of this, though. They actually do try to buy up the surplus, but they can't afford it. So they print out money and either buy it themselves or they give it to consumers, like buying up the weapons for war. And like Adam said, this creates money without more production. And when that happens, too many dollars are chasing too few goods and then you get inflation. This temporarily relieves some stress. The workers absorb it in you know, a little percent here, percent there, but they only absorb so much. It kicks the can down the road into a worse crisis. And that's exactly the crisis that's waiting to erupt. And in the world's greatest economic power, the USA, which like Alan said yesterday is bankrupt, the debt is outstripping the GDP and growing by a trillion every three months. Um, yeah, million, million dollars. <laughs> and, and will it's a million, 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 right? I, I don't know. And will... <laughs> 20 zeros. <laughs> um, and this will itself explode in the coming period. Creating a massive opportunity for the revolutionary communists to wipe this irrationality away. Thanks, comrade. Next will be Nelson from Britain. Comrades, I'd like to come in on some of these questions. A comrade asked, why is there waste under capitalism? Because the capitalist market uh, is anarchic. It doesn't operate according to a conscious plan. One capitalist produces a commodity, food, for example, not depending on how much food we actually need, but on how much profit they can make. No consideration is given to the natural limits of the market. And when so many millions of capitalists produce so much food for sale, this naturally results in overproduction and massive waste. Plus, that food that is overproduced cannot simply be given away. Because if it was, that would reduce the demand in the market for food and thus harm the capitalist profits. 
So all of these millions of tons of food that is produced and not consumed is poisoned and destroyed, as is the case with many other commodities that are produced like clothes. Does AI fundamentally change the nature of capitalist production? As Adam said, uh, no, it doesn't. AI ultimately is highly productive constant capital. Uh, machinery at the end of the day. It doesn't matter how advanced or how productive machinery is, it is still incapable of producing new value. It is only capable of transferring its own existing value. The socially necessary labor time embodied within the machine. The comrade asked how exactly this happens in production. In the course of production, the machine imparts its value bit by bit. <coughs> until the machine is destroyed or requires new human labor power to restore it. A machine, once it's made, does not last forever. It requires maintenance, fixing, new raw materials. It needs coal, gas, electricity to be consumed in order for that machine to continue imparting value in production. If a machine is more productive, like a computer, for example, all this means is that the time taken to impart its own value is longer. The machine lasts longer before it needs fixing. AI is highly advanced and has enormous productive potential, but in essence it is still dead labor. AI is incapable of restoring its own value like human labor power can. A comrade already touched upon what is needed to produce AI. Computer chips, electricity, server space, vast amounts of water for the cooling systems. These things don't come out of nowhere. They're not produced uh, out of thin air. They all require huge amounts of human labor power in the final analysis. On Peter's question about canceling out debts, we as communists would absolutely demand the canceling of debts as part of a, the revolutionary transformation of society. Clearing the debts which enslave nations and workers across the world. But from a capitalist perspective, wiping out debt would be catastrophic. Because this debt is introduced to facilitate profit making. Debt expands the market beyond its natural limits. And as Adam said, this debt is fictitious capital. So it behaves in the real economy as if it is real capital, even though no real value is there backing it. The fictitious capital is used to buy commodities, to pay wages, to trade. So if the debt bubble collapses, this means defaults on loans, property repossessions, business closures, job losses, uh, and a widespread crisis. Because all of these things have been sustained on fictitious capital and not on real value that exists within the economy. This is why the 2008 crisis was so devastating for the world economy because of the collapse of the enormous bubble of fictitious capital that had been built up in the financial markets, in the housing market. So the capitalists are unable to simply cancel out the huge debts because they rely on them. In fact, what was the capitalist response to 2008 and 2020? They actually further increased the amount of fictitious capital that was pumped into the system because they literally had no other choice. This is the meaning of the bank bailouts and other things that took place. So the capitalists are damned if they do, damned if they don't. And so the only way ultimately to end the waste, 
to fully utilize AI and the other productive capacity that we have, to, to end wage and debt slavery, is of course to end the root cause of all of these things, which is capitalist production itself. Thanks, comrade. Next is, I don't know your name, so if you can. Odin from the Danish section. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to have a point in relation to some of the questions and the capitalist class abilities to prop up the system. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's about the capitalist class abilities to prop up the system as a whole. It is important to distinguish between the capitalist class and individual capitalists. While they are a combined class united by their collective class interests, they are also engaged in internal competition. So that means what would be good for the combined capitalist class can be against the interest of individual capitalists and vice versa. I think uh, wage decreases is a good example of this. The capitalist would love their direct competitors and other capitalists to increase the wages to allow workers to buy more commodities. But at the same time, every individual capitalist also tries to decrease the wages as to increase their own profits and comp competitiveness on the market as a whole. And that is very important when we do the practical analysis of the, the capitalist class and, and the, the way they deal with the, with the problems they face. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, comrade. And uh, the final speaker will be... Sorry, I actually met him yesterday and I forgot his name. <laughs> Sean from the British section. Uh, and then uh, Adam will have plenty of time to sum up and flesh out some of the answers to the questions. Thank you, comrade chair. Um, comrades, a number of other comrades have touched on uh, this question of AI and automation already. So I don't really propose to take up much more of your time with it. Um, but this question of automation and how it affects the working class is a key one for this question of AI, I think. And I think if we strip away the, the hype, uh, especially from the tech capitalists who uh, seem to think they're building the Terminator, I think what Nelson uh, said previously is true. AI is just a particularly unusual tool, a machine. Mm -hmm. He's obviously explained what that means, but there are two um, historical kind of results of automation. Uh, machines that could save uh, la uh, labor time, that could make work a lot easier for workers under capitalism have a different effect. On the one hand, uh, you see them being used to fling a lot of work, to uh, make a lot of workers redundant. Adding them to the reserve army of labour that the uh, comrade from earlier talked about. But the other side of this equation is those workers who are left uh, in the workplace often find themselves f uh, forced to work much harder and much more intensively as a result of this process. This is so that the capitalists can squeeze as much out of them as possible. But I think the capitalists face two problems as well with this, and we'll see this with AI. The first uh, problem is the uh, problem of the tendency of rate to, of profit to fall, as Adam explained. Um, obviously, implementation of AI on the scale that capitalists are claiming they will do mm -hmm. um, would massively increase uh, the balance in favour of constant capital versus vari uh, variable capital. Uh, and thus really aggravate this tendency. Probably bigger though uh, than this in my opinion. We are currently in, as other comrades have said, an era of crisis since 2008. A crisis of overproduction already in many respects. We've already established that workers are the vast majority of consumers under a capitalist economy. So to ask a rhetorical question, what happens when you stop those uh, consumers from being able to consume by taking away the jobs that they uh, get their wages from? In reality, these policies, if they were implemented, would in fact massively aggravate the crisis even further by shrinking the market the capitalists have to realize their profit in. But this doesn't have to be inevitable. I think Comrade Nelson uh, summed it up well. Under a, a worker's plan of production, under a worker's state, these methods that cause such problems for workers under capitalism would be the precise way we would free workers from the drudgery of labor so that they could run society. That's all from me, thank you. Okay, comrades, well, I think it's been a really excellent discussion. 
um, all of the questions were fantastic and, and really revealed, um, you know, uh, in, in, you know, really showed a lot of the, 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 the applications of Marxist economics to today's problems. Questions that I'm sure we all face in our work uh, and that any worker faces in their workplace. You know, the fear of being replaced by one of these robots or chatbots. Um, and uh, yeah, all this uh, nonsense we hear about overpopulation uh, from the Malthusian types. Uh, and I think the comrades uh, who, who answered these questions have done a fantastic job and, and saved me a lot of time. Um, good example of, uh, you know, competition, I guess. Reduce the socially necessary labor time for my sum up, which might drive down my wage, I guess. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not selling a commodity. Um, but I think uh, Nelson in particular touched on the answer to actually quite a few of the first questions. Something I didn't really have time to go into in the lead off, which is this question of the anarchy of the market. Um, I, 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 I won't repeat what he said about the, uh, the question of waste because I think his answer was spot on. But it, it's just, you know, it emphasizes the point that, that private property is, is one of the main barriers facing society. Uh, and, and yeah, far from having overpopulation, we have this overproduction. That I think the statistic was given yesterday in, in the discussion on the manifesto, the, the amount of food produced far exceeding the population. And in fact, the Malthusians, they were, I mean, Malthus himself was extreme reactionary. And Malthusianism continues to um, uh, kind of find a, uh, an echo on, on the right and on the left, unfortunately, today. You know, in current forms, it's uh, less that there's too many people, maybe too many old people. Oh, we're, all too we're all living too long, apparently, according to the capitalists. There aren't enough young people to sustain all the old people and their demands on the healthcare system. Well, why can't we produce more with less labor? That, in fact, has been the whole historic justification for capitalism, that it was able to develop the productive forces so that fewer labor, uh, workers, less labor, could produce more wealth. The, the real crisis isn't a crisis of too many old people. It's a crisis of a senile system. You know, if the, if the system was able to develop the productive forces to, to increase productivity through technology and technique, then we would be able to have fully automated luxury lives and we could live far beyond uh, the, the, the current uh, you know, life expectancy. And we could reduce the retirement age to, to less and less. In fact, even uh, kind of utopian capitalist uh, economists have, have talked about the problem of leisure time that the f a future society should face because of automation, which, which seems like quite a sick joke right now, I'm sure, to most workers. I think Keynes actually wrote an essay saying that, you know, in a few generations, the main problem would be this. What, what do we do with all our free time? I mean, this is a man who had a bit too much free time of his own. He came from the bourgeois class, swanning around with the rest of the Bloomsbury group. But uh, clearly his uh, prophecy never came true. He couldn't see the contradictions that, that meant that that would never be realized under capitalism. In the same way that he couldn't see the contradictions inherent in his own economic theories. But yeah, I mean, we should be talking about not just um, a retirement age. We should be talking about, you know, applying automation and technology across every sector such that work is like a, a, a service you perform for a few years, you know. You know, not, not just reducing the working day and the working week, but the working lifespan. You know, you have your, you have your university education and beyond lifelong education, in fact. And somewhere along the way, you, you, you know, you, you do a few years work and, you know, you can uh, have to spend the rest of your time pursuing arts, culture, science, and of course, the democratic running of society. So yeah, our overpopulation is extremely reactionary as a theory. But it appears also on the left, as I said, in this form of degrowth which, uh, you know, it proclaims to be anti-capitalist in, in some cases. But it's really not, because it doesn't have that, that scientific approach that I talked about of Marxism earlier. Um, it talks about a growth ideology, whereas Marx wrote three volumes of Capital, as has been mentioned, to explain the actual objective dynamics of growth, of capitalist accumulation, uh, and many other things which I'll come on to later in answer to Erica's question. Um, he showed that growth isn't, isn't some mindset that we can just do away with. It's a do or die question for the capitalists to reinvest their surplus back into production in order to expand their production, in order to make it more efficient, in order to try and reduce their costs, in order to try and push out their competitors, and thereby to try and capture more of the market and increase their profits. And that's not an ideological question. 
like, as I said, it's an objective force that, that, that is pressure put on them despite you know, their intentions. If they don't do it, someone else will. So it's this race to the bottom. And um, uh, yeah, this is, this is the problem that this degrowth uh, idea doesn't, this theory, so-called theory, doesn't really get to the root of. You know, imagine that we can choose to just turn growth on and off like a tap. It's kind of the argument of the Keynesians turned inside out, actually. They, the two sides of the reformists, if you like. You know, the Keynesians say you can stimulate growth and that's a good thing. And the degrowth is saying, no, 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 don't stimulate growth. Just clamp down on growth, reduce growth. There's a word for when you don't have growth under capitalism. It's called a recession. And from what I've seen, it, it doesn't work out so well for the majority of people. In, in fact, carbon emissions dropped very uh, fast during the pandemic. And maybe the degrowthers were celebrating, you know, having the herbal teas over a Zoom call together. I should add, I quite like herbal teas. It gets too much discredit, I think. But the point is, you know, for the majority of people, that, that meant suffering. It meant, uh, it meant you know, these, these piling up of debts that we've heard about. It led to inflation, to further austerity. It led to an you know, enormous amount of job insecurity, to, uh, to health and safety problems for workers in their, uh, who were forced to work. In any case, I don't, I don't want to labor the point, no pun intended. But the point is, you can see that if you abandon that scientific approach and you treat the economy as an ideological question, you fall back into the same utopianism that marked the utopian socialists that Marx was criticizing. In fact, I would say these degrowthers, that on the one hand, the, they, the, they come from the legacy of, of Malthus, if you like, but they also come from the legacy of the utopian socialists. They're like the modern equivalents of people like Saint-Simon, Fourier, Robert Owen, these these people who thought that they could just imagine a blueprint for an alternative society uh, and bring it about through sheer force of will and uh, ideological um, kind of education and all these kind of things, rather than understanding the material conditions that would be needed for that alternative form of society and, and the revolution in society that would be needed to overthrow the old system and bring that new system into place. So yeah, I think, I think comrades have very well explained. The real problem we have is overproduction, not overpopulation. And it's, it's this anarchy of the market that is responsible for waste, for pollution, for the destruction of the environment. And, it, and it's private property along with the nation state that are the two big barriers to the development of society and the productive forces. And the nation state, just to touch, this, this relates to Peter's question about the European Union. And, and in fact, it really explains all of the problems you see with all these kind of imperialist blocks and trade agreements and so forth. You, then none of these are going to work under capitalism, which inherently has this nation state. You know, the EU was, was all well and good when all of these uh, different countries' economies were moving in the same direction. But the minute there was a crisis, and under capitalism there's always eventually a crisis, you see the reality of what the EU was always about. An, an imperialist project, the, the, the weaker imperialist powers like France and Germany huddling together for warmth and also trying to achieve through trade agreements and the single currency what two world wars failed to achieve, which was the complete domination of Europe by German imperialism. That's what the EU has been about. It's been about extracting surplus value, well, exporting capital to uh, the periphery of Europe and then uh, pulling profits from these countries back to the, the metropoles in uh, in Frankfurt, in Paris. Um, and yeah, the minute there was that crisis, suddenly you saw all these different economies moving in different directions at different paces. And there you saw the limits of the nation state. They hadn't been overcome within this capitalist block. And, that, and that's what it is. It's a capitalist imperialist block. That's why we as Marxists are against the European Union and similarly against the WTO and all these other imperialist uh, blocks and trade agreements, as I say. We're in favor in, of internationalism, obviously but international solidarity and, and economic planning, not uh, international uh, profiteering and exploitation in the, for the benefit of a few. But yes, going back to this question of the anarchy of the market, it relates also to uh, the other Adam's question about uh, the crisis of overproduction uh, and also to Frank's question about AI. I think Erica partially answered this question about the crisis of overproduction. Why can't the capitalists just buy up the goods that aren't sold? I mean, if we're talking about consumer goods, they'd have a problem. Like, they can't eat that much. You know, there's only so many houses and holiday homes they can have. They do their best to absorb it. You know, if you're talking about why not then reorientate production towards, you know, luxury goods, more champagne, more yachts. Well, there's a limit to that too. <laughs> 
But more importantly, is the, the, the point of capitalism, as I said, historically, was for the capitalists to reinvest that surplus into new forces of production. The, the capitalist who squanders all of his profits on luxury items is going to eventually be outcompeted by the capitalist who's a, a little bit more thrifty, a little bit more shrewd, who actually intelligently invests in you know, the next big technology and tries to push his competitors out of the market. You know, it's all well and good for Elon Musk and these others to fire themselves up into space. I hope they stay there. <laughs> oh, you know, to buy up Twitter at a vastly overvalued price and turn it into X, the home of all sorts of reactionary uh, nonsense. But it hasn't been too good for the share price of uh, Twitter and X and uh, hasn't been too good for the, uh, the wealth of, of Elon Musk either, which a lot of it is just fictitious capital <laughs> in shares, as has been pointed out. But then the real question is the one Alan asked yesterday. Why aren't we actually in a permanent crisis then if there's all these unsold goods? Well, it is because, it is because precisely the capitalists reinvest that surplus in, historically into more means of production. But then that generates new contradictions because new pr means of production mean producing more commodities. And those commodities have to find a market. And so capitalism has this cycle of, of accumulation and reinvestment and growth in this extremely unplanned, anarchic, unharmonious way. And in doing so, it generates the same contradiction of overproduction at a higher level. Obviously, trying to find new markets in new countries through imperialism, that has its limits, as we see with the proxy conflicts that are taking place today over the spheres of influence, markets and raw materials. They can try and use credit, as has been explained, to try and artificially expand demand, artificially expand the market. But that also has its limits, as has been pointed out. That, was, that, that reached its pinnacle with the 2008 crisis. Although not quite the pinnacle, because as has been explained, they've carried on inflating all the debt bubbles, household debt, corporate debt, government debt ever since then. <laughs> and, and so you see capitalism, as Marx explains in the Communist Manifesto, it can always get out of these crises, but only by paving the way for a bigger crisis down the line. And, and this relates then to this question of AI as well, that comrades have touched on. Because, yeah, it's, it's, it's not out of uh, some sort of scientific interest or, or uh, some sort of utopian vision that the, the capitalists invest in AI and automation. In fact, the capitalist only ever invests in machinery and, and all these other things, which, as comrades explained, are like machinery, if it's profitable. If it's more profitable to invest in that machinery, that automation, than to employ cheap workers, for example. In fact, it's worth trying to separate the hype from the reality in this situation. A lot of the bourgeois are actually scratching their heads right now because there's all this promise of AI, but the productivity has barely improved in the last 20 years. They say you can see computers and AI everywhere but in the productivity statistics. Well, we, we have an explanation for that, which is that decades of, of attacks on the working class, of, of exporting to production to, to other countries with even lower wages, Erosion of wages, of conditions worldwide it means that in many cases it's cheaper to employ, you know, low pay, often migrant labor than to invest in a new factory or machine. But nevertheless, we clearly see that there is development of new technologies over history. There has been an increase in productivity from now compared to, you know, 100 years ago. The, the, the capitalists are forced, as I say, to constantly invest and reinvest their surplus into technology to keep up with their competitors who do. And, uh, and, and the result of this, uh, yeah, is, is a number of contradictions. As has been pointed out, this doesn't happen in a nice harmonious way. The capitalists even have a phrase that they call it creative destruction. It's a 50% accurate phrase. There's a lot of destruction these days. I don't see much creativity, especially if we're calling AI generated art creativity. But no, the, the point is they destroy jobs. They throw workers onto the scrap heap. But because, as I think it was uh, Odin from Denmark pointed out, there's a difference between what's good for the individual capitalist and what's good for the capitalist class as a whole. The individual capitalist doesn't care whether you're on the scrap heap in the dole queue or whether another capitalist is going to give you a low-paid job and as a delivery rider. All they care is their own, about is their own profits. And so you see technology being introduced and developed, but in this extremely anarchic, chaotic and destructive way. As has been pointed out, AI is, is used to de-skill the working class, to, to pull wages down. You know, in London, uh, they used to have these uh, black cab drivers. I think they still exist. 
Uh, and to be one of them, you had to learn all of the roads across London. It was called, um, what was it called? The Knowledge. The Knowledge, yes. Sorry. Now Uber comes along, everyone has a smartphone. You know, suddenly there's an enormous amount of workers who can do that job for much cheaper. Brings down the average wage, the, the socially necessary labor time that goes into that job. You know, you don't need that education, that learning anymore to be that, that, that driver. So you see how the technology has been introduced there, but it's brought the wage down and, and I'm sure pushed the profits up. And the same applies for graphic designers. You know, we've had the Hollywood strikes over this question recently. It's de-skilling. Comrades talked about, yeah, how it also has the effect of, uh, yeah, pulling down the rate of profit over time. Just imagine if you actually started to approach full automation. That would mean no socially necessary labor time. It would mean values falling towards zero. So unless monopolies dominated everything, which they kind of do, prices would tend towards zero. Profits would tend towards zero. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a graphic uh, illustration of what Marx said. The forces of production, the ability to produce, coming into conflict with the mode of production, the way in which we distribute wealth, the way in which wealth and uh, capital, in this case, is owned. And, uh, and, and this really shows you one of the contradictions of, of AI and automation. But the other is, is, as Sean and others pointed out, the fact that at the end of the day, these machines, they're not paid a wage. Although I've heard some mad ideas about unionizing robots and making sure they're compensated fairly. I'm sure Wally will be very happy to hear that. But, um, but no, there's a very good little anecdote that illustrates this point. When uh, Ford in the, in the 20th century started introducing mass production techniques in its car factories, and, and one of the um, trade union organizers was having to show around uh, Henry Ford himself to one of the, the factories. And Henry Ford, very smug, I'm not going to do the American accent, <laughs> said, uh, ha, look at that. How are you going to get these machines to pay your union dues? And apparently the trade union organizer turned around and said, yeah, but how are you going to get them to buy your cars? <laughs> and now Tesla's talking about fully automated factories. So I'd ask Elon Musk, name keeps on coming up. I'd, I'd ask Elon Musk the same question. How are you going to get them to buy your electric vehicles? Um, just on some of the other questions. Um, I think this, uh, this question of the debt was, was also dealt with very well by Nelson. The capitalists, uh, they might not, I don't think they will default for all the reasons that, uh, that Nelson explained. But there's still no such thing as a free lunch, as they say. They'll resort more and more to printing money, trying to devalue their own debts, if you like. But we know who ends up paying the bill for that workers whose wages aren't going to be increasing in line with inflation. Inflation that will happen if you try and print away all of these trillions and trillions in debt. I mean, it would, it would enormously uh, weaken the role of the dollar if, if America was to try and default. And then the dollar is underpinning the entire global financial system. It's a very good example of the relative decline of US imperialism, actually. And, and the, the situation we, we've, we've talked about militarily, American imperialism is still far more militarily powerful than all the other uh, rivals. But nevertheless, its relative decline opens the door for all manner of instability geopolitically. And it's the same with the world currency, the dollar. There's no currency that's going to replace the dollar right now. None of the other capitalist powers are strong enough to, to have the currencies as the, world, as the world currency. But nevertheless, the relative weakening of American capitalism, as illustrated by its massive debts, it, it undermines the dollar and it undermines then the whole financial system that the capitalist system rests on. Um, finally then on, on Erica's question, what on earth is in three volumes of capital? I mean, that would be <laughs> a whole week-long uh, lecture. But in summary, you can, you can kind of look at the three volumes of capital in, in the following way. Volume one is where Marx really looks inside the factory and tries to understand uh, the law of value. It's where he explains the law of value and, and consequently uh, where profit comes from, the law of capitalist accumulation, which in turn explains a lot of the questions we've explained today. All these questions about machinery, inequality, that's all covered in volume one. Volume two is when he goes into what he calls circulation of capital. In other words, what happens once the commodity leaves the factory and has to be transformed into money, has to be sold, and how that money is then transformed back into more commodities, more profit. 
It's a very relevant volume if you want to understand some of the supply shocks and the inflation crisis that we've seen over recent years. And then volume three is where he kind of brings it all together, if you like. Introduces the market, the idea of prices, supply and demand, and how capital flows around the economy. And introducing the idea of the rate of profit to explain how capital finds the highest profit and, uh, and, and then moves capital to, to the most profitable sectors. And as I said at the beginning, in doing so, it, it determines the whole division of labor globally. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think all of these are, are very worth reading in time. As I said, along with the philosophy to understand the dialectical method that underpins it all. And one of the best things I think you can do is, is to try and apply these ideas to the real world today. You know, read the bourgeois economists and the press with a, with a critical eye. Or, or, or more importantly, talk to workers and, uh, and, and see how these ideas explain the problems they face in the workplace. Try and explain the ideas of exploitation, of, uh, of profit and so forth in a way that's uh, really accessible and digestible to, to workers who are facing these problems, you know, in real life. But I think, uh, yeah, I think all of this explains, all of this um, highlights the need for us to understand these laws of capitalism. And these laws, as I said at the beginning, which seem like a kind of omnipotent force imposed upon us, uh, a very mystical force that we're told we can't understand. We just have to leave it up to the bankers and the clever people. And those are two distinct categories, bankers and clever people. <laughs> but the point is, these are laws that can be understood and in doing so, they can be overcome and replaced. You know, we can't do away with the laws of capitalism by wishing them away. We can't ignore them by just imagining they don't exist. In the same way that I can't jump out of the window and just hope the gravity doesn't exist. But actually, to, to extend that analogy, if I understand the laws of gravity, the laws of, uh, you know, aerodynamics, laws of motion and physics, you know, we can create machines that can fly into the sky and into the stars. As I said, instead of having the billionaires shooting off into space, we can be the ones exploring the universe. Similarly with thermodynamics, you know, with, with that understanding, we can understand a very complex system, you know, particles, uh, you know, uh, dynamically hitting up against each other, seemingly at random. But in fact, there are, when you step back, you see there are laws that are govern, governing that, that, you know, erratic motion. And with an understanding of those laws, you can turn heat into light and electricity. You, you can move incredible forces. It was the whole basis for the Industrial Revolution. Comrades talked about the way in which science is being held back by capitalism. Well, if we understand the laws of capitalism and replace them, then we won't just have an industrial and economic revolution, we'll have a scientific revolution as well. It'll be what Engels described as the leap from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. What laws are we replacing capitalism with? We're replacing that anarchic law of value with that of conscious organization and planning by replacing private property with common ownership and workers' control, starting with these giant monopolies that have planning already within them, but that under capitalism uh, are dominating over us and exploiting us. We'd bring production out of the market, develop the productive forces, invest in automation and provide working class with that leisure time that we talked about just now to pursue art and culture and science, to run society for ourselves. And over time, more and more, you'd have commodity production withering away, being replaced by conscious planning. And in doing so, markets and money, they would wither away also in this transition from socialism to communism. And instead, we'd be organizing and allocating society's resources harmoniously and rationally. And we'd be bringing about a society with that communist principle that we all know from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Thank you.